his lab at LSU, finally made his way back to Davis in 2012. And Andrew is the rare evolutionary physiologist. And you know, we were just talking, there's not that many that sort of have his sort of joint perspective of toxicology as well as evolution, and of course ecology as well. So eco, evo, toxico, something along those lines. Um, and first of all, Andrew works in some of the worst places, I think, on the planet. Uh, and, and I always assume that he loves these places, but, but apparently he doesn't. But you know, we're, we're talking about toxic waste dumps into estuary, just super fun sites, where these cute little fishes that you'll hear about more today, little fundalists, have adapted to these environments and are able to tolerate these sort of PCBs and just, just awful chemicals. And uh, I mean, his recent paper in Nature is one of the sort of nicest, clearest examples of recent adaptive introgression in response to this sort of human pollution. So it, it's rapid, probably one of the strongest selection gradients in ever. Uh, one of the sort of the just clearest, cleanest examples, which I think I'm going into this a little bit more because I don't think you'll actually talk about that no, too much. Today. No, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, um, take it away. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Uh, Michael and, uh, and Chris for inviting me here today. So yeah, we do a strange mix of things in the lab. Um, we do, uh, so I've actually trained in toxicology and I did sort of like a 90 degree turn for postdoc in sort of evolutionary <laughs> genetics. And when I started my lab at LSU, um, it was still along evolutionary genetic slides. And that's where we start, first started studying sort of osmoregulatory physiology that I can be talking more about today, but then I sort of like slowly got reeled back into sort of the toxicology world and and uh, looking at evolution and, and super fun sites. And I have to be very clear, it's super fun, not super fun. These are <laughs> disgusting, <laughs> disgusting places, some of the most horribly polluted places in the, in the world, and we've, um, we've done uh, a fair bit of work on that, in the particularly in the last few years. But I'm not going to talk about any of that today, but you can find the papers on our website. Um, I'm going to talk more about... Um, uh, some of the work that we've been doing uh, with the same model animal, the same species, and, and also sort of branching out to within the genus to, to try and understand um, the mechanistic basis of physiological flexibility, where we focus on optimal regulation as the, the physiology that we're interested in, but also how these physiologies evolve and how those uh, might relate to some interesting patterns of biodiversity that we see within the fishes. So, uh, so we think of fish, you know, uh, I just found out that, like, you just hired the first ecology <laughs> uh, collections manager at your uh, museum, uh, museum of Vertebrate Zoology, and, and great, because they, they represent a huge proportion of the vertebrate uh, biodiversity that we see uh, on the planet. And what's, what's remarkable is that when you think about the environments that these fish occupy on the planet, right? What's that habitable environment that they live in? Obviously, we're thinking of aquatic environments, and oceans make up the vast proportion of this habitable space for fish. It's about 96.5% uh, of the, the planet's water we find in the oceans. When we think of fresh water, only a very small fraction of the globe's water is fresh water, and only a very small fraction of that is actually surface fresh water. The other is groundwater or glaciers where you're not going to find fish. And only a very small fraction of that is not frozen as permafrost, it is in lakes, or in rivers. So like a small fraction of 1% of the planet's water, habitable water, is fresh water. Yet when you look at the number of species of fish, about half of them are freshwater species and the other half are marine. So you could argue that this marine to fresh gradient is probably the, one of these steepest, if not the steepest biodiversity gradients in the planet, on the planet. And so clearly these Transitions between marine and fresh water are, are important for the diversity of uh, fish species that, that we see uh, occupying aquatic habitats. Um, so, you know, to make this jump between sort of a marine type of fish and a freshwater fish is kind of hard. So here's a very oversimplified uh, diagram of the challenges of living in a marine environment or a freshwater environment. So, uh, all Almost all vertebrates um, keep their sort of internal saltiness at around 300 milliosmoles, somewhere in, or, in and around there. And if you're a marine fish, 
um, you need to maintain an internal salty concentration that's more dilute than your external environment. Okay? And so you need to offset uh, this diffusion gradient of losing water and gaining ions by drinking, secreting ions, and producing uh, uh, urine. Whereas in fresh water, you've got the opposite challenge, that the uh, external environment is more dilute than the internal environment that you need to regulate. Okay? So here you're trying to fight water from uh, uh, coming in and losing ions, and you do that by active ion uptake from the environment and producing very, very dilute urine. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's very coarsely the challenge of a creature living in a marine in a freshwater environment. Right? Um, so it turns out that these transitions between species that live in marine environments and uh, transitions into freshwater environments, these transitions are actually pretty ancient and pretty common to all the vertebrate uh, lineages. So here's uh, our vertebrate phylogeny that everyone in this room is very, very familiar with. Okay, here's uh, us. Um, and uh, almost all of these lineages have some ancestry in both marine and fresh and estuarine environments, right? So we go really ancient. Most hagfish are exclusively, all hagfish, as far as we know, are exclusively marine. Once we get into you know, the lamprey, there uh, uh, are you know, fresh and uh, migratory and marine lamprey. Same thing for sharks raising chimeras. Uh, and all these different species. So we're going to walk through this. So hagfish exclusively marine. Uh, hagfish are these really, do you have any, do you have any hagfish? <laughs> no, it's not a hagfish. Uh, <laughs> 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 also known as snot eels, although they don't produce snot and they're not eels. But um, this is actually one of the weirdest uh, news stories of 2017. Uh, about 7,000 pounds of hagfish. There was like an accident on a highway in Oregon. Uh, and this, uh, they, this truck carrying hagfish like slimed the entire highway. That was, that was the car behind the, the hagfish truck. Um, anyways, uh, so hagfish are exclusively marine. And then lampreys, again, there are marine and estuarine and freshwater lineages uh, within that clade. Sharks rays and chimeras, same thing. There are freshwater rays. There are uh, urihaline sharks. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, diversity within, within that clade as well. Coelacanths, extant coelacanths are exclusively marine. Um, and I just always thought that coelacanths was a, a, an exclusively marine lineage. But I was giving a talk at the Sacramento Aquarium Society uh, uh, a couple of years ago, and somebody's like, no, there were freshwater coelacanths. And I'm like, I don't think there were. He's like, yes, there were. And sure enough, I go back and dig in the literature, and the fossil record tells us that there were freshwater coelacanths. I had no idea. Um, uh, lungfish, at least the extant lungfish, are exclusively freshwater <coughs> with probably some marine ancestry. And then rayfin fish has occupied pretty much any habitable aquatic space on the planet, including you know, hypersaline and fresh and, and seawater and estuarine environments. Right? So, so when we think about the physiology within these lineages, whether you osmoregulate or ionoregulate, so hagfish uh, osmoconform, meaning that um, their internal Osmolality, their internal salinity is the same as their external environment, right? Uh, but once we get to lampreys, they osmoregulate and they ionoregulate. Um, and uh, so this machinery to, to adjust uh, your internal physiology different from your environment is pretty old, right? So sharks, rays, and chimeras, they actually osmoconform, um, but they ionoregulate. The difference is like, so you look at the um, sort of osmotic balance of their body versus their external environment, and it, it's the same. But the only reason it's the same is because they crank out a ton of urea. So they actually regulate sodium and chloride about to the same level as modern fishes do, like Telios fishes, but they osmoconform because they crank out a ton of urea. But again, in this lineage, their ability to ionoregulate, to regulate sodium and chloride to about the same level as as other fishes is, is pretty similar. Okay, coelacanths, again, they, uh, they, osmo, they ionoregulate, but they osmoconform again because they produce urea. Lungfish, regulators, rayfin fishes, they're regulators. So 
all of these lineages harbor the, the machinery to be able to uh, osmoregulate and iotoregulate. So this machinery is pretty good <coughs> for being able to make these, these leaps between, between these habitats that we see in all of these lineages. So I'm going to focus down uh, to sort of uh, ray fin fishes now, these, uh, these more dry types. And within the ray fin fishes, um, we see that the directionality between sort of marine, you know, salty environments and freshwater environments is <coughs> remarkably unidirectional. Um, so the marine state, so these are all sort of the major uh, groups of teleost fishes, or not uh, the ray fin fishes. And uh, marine lineages are in red, the freshwater lineages are in blue, and urihalane, which I'll talk about more later, is that sort of super flexibility uh, uh, physiological type is purple. You can see that the ancestral state uh, is almost exclusively marine. So these transitions are almost exclusively from marine to fresh. So almost university unidirectional. There are some exceptions, but very, very few, like the um, some catfish where there have been some freshwater to seawater transitions, but but by and large uh, it's really asymmetrical uh, the direction uh, of, of marine marine to fresh. Um, but the freshwater environments seem to have been refugia for some of these really uh, deeply rooting lineages, uh, where they've appear to have been outcompeted in marine environments. So, like uh, bigers and gars and sturgeon. The extant species now are all freshwater, but in the fossil record there were a lot of uh, marine, marine types in those lineages too. Okay, so, so we, we've, we've been sort of thinking about sort of marine, freshwater types, but um, there's also this other sort of general class of physiology that's called uh, ur uh, urihaline physiology, where you can be super flexible uh, as a fish. You can acclimate to seawater and you can acclimate to really dilute fresh water um, where you can really adjust your physiology to do this to take up ions and produce dual urine but if you find yourself in this environment you can sort of switch around and adjust <coughs> adjust your physiology and that's um, that's actually pretty rare but here's the definite <laughs> definite the fancy terms for this are stenohaline and urihaline stenohaline means you've got a sort of a, a narrow specialization in terms of your Healing, your, your salty <laughs> habitat, um, versus urihaline, you can span a lot of uh, uh, salty habitats. So for example, if you look at the, sort of the concentration of salt in the water and your ability to maintain osmotic homeostasis in your blood, for example, uh, we've got some marine species that can do pretty well, uh, but when it gets really dilute, they lose it and they die, right? And then you've got freshwater specialists like goldfish, you know, they're fine, they're really dilute water, but once it gets even close to the isoosmotic point, you really lose it. Uh, the loser ability to osmoregulate, and that's fatal. Like, if you can't maintain your salt concentrations in your plasma, then all, all the wheels come off the bus, uh, cell biology-wise. But then we've got these rare creatures like tilapia and killifish and eels and a few other species that are able to maintain their plasma osmolality across a huge range of salinities. And some of the superstars for this are species that, that Chris specializes on, some of the you know, tilapia and cichlids and suprinid on the puffish, and, and the killifish that, that we uh, have worked on. So, uh, so when you look across the fishes, okay, so these are most of the sort of uh, ray fin fishes, the major, major groups, um, almost all of the species in any given clade specializes as a marine clade or a freshwater clade, right? Um, we don't see a lot of transitions within a clade, right? Except for a few exceptional clades, one being the percomorphs. They're the most speciose of the, uh, of the fishes, and they, they're unusual in that, you know, a good, good fraction uh, of species are marine, and another good fraction is freshwater. They're kind of split here. Another thing about the percomorphs is that they've got among one of the highest uh, uh, speciation rates of any vertebrate lineage. So this is a number of vertebrate lineages here. This is one of Michael Farah's papers from a few, uh, few years ago, where they were looking at, uh, at diversification rates. That's, you know, 
adjusted for all these other constraints. And the perkamorphs have a rank number one in terms of the diversification rate within, within the clade. Um, it also turns out that the perkamorphs harbor an unusual proportion of the urihaline species of fish, right? So only about 9% of fish taxa could be considered urihaline, or probably less than that, depending on how you define it. But the vast majority of those are to be found within the perkamorphs. So in my mind, these are maybe not unconnected things, that we've got a lot of urihaline species here, we've got a lot of transitions, between marine and fresh water, and that contributes to maybe very high diversification rates. So it's led us to thinking that perhaps urihalinity, even though it's rare, might be important for seeding diversification into freshwater or marine environments when the opportunity arises, uh, at least when it performs. So we're interested in, you know, what, uh, what are the mechanisms that underlie urihalinity, which I'm going to talk a little bit about our, our, our research uh, right now, which we're trying to elaborate on. And, uh, and then I'm going to get into how we've been using killifish as a micro and macro evolutionary model system to try to understand some of these transitions between these, these uh, marine types, salty water types, and, and freshwater types. So I'm mainly going to show you some, some published data from our lab um, in the next few slides, and then some brand new, almost unanalyzed data <laughs> from the lab that's come out the last few weeks of some new projects that we've got, uh, got going on. Okay. So, Urihalinity, as I mentioned before, is this ability to adjust your physiology, sometimes very, very quickly, to changes in your external osmotic environment. So killifish, similar to saprinidon, you can they can adjust to dilute fresh water all the way up to like four times the salinity of seawater. Like the salt's falling out of solution before you can kill them. Um, <laughs> so it's pretty, pretty remarkable. Uh, and they can make that adjustment very, very quickly, sometimes within hours of remodeling, re remodeling their gill. So uh, this is your gill and freshwater. Um, at least coarsely speaking, the morphology of the ionocytes, the, the cell types that actually do the pushing and pulling of ions, they've got a very different morphology in freshwater than they do in seawater. In freshwater, they've got a very large surface area on the surface of the gill, the interface with the water. Whereas in seawater, um, these ionocytes, they've got a very tight little apical crypt. Uh, so this tight little hole on the water surface of the gill, but this big sort of bulb underneath the surface and the ion sites like deep imbe deeply embedded within, within there. So we've got these you know, pretty significant morphological changes in the structure of the gill that happen uh, between a freshwater type and a seawater type. And this, this adjustment can happen pretty quickly, at least within uh, some populations of fungulus heterocytes, <coughs> the Atlantic killifish, it's been our model. They can make this transition within about a day or two, um, but it's really expensive. It costs about 10% of their energy budget to, to do this remodeling. And they can go back and forth. So it's not like a developmental plasticity thing. It's just a physiological elasticity kind of thing where they can go back and forth. <clears throat> so we did some experiments where we were trying to sort of pharmacologically inhibit uh, this response and then use some molecular tools to try and figure out uh, maybe some of the, the, the molecular mechanisms that, that underlie this. Okay. So here's a fish in fresh water. These are some transcriptional profiling. This is way back in the day of microarrays. Um, but here we're looking at the expression of uh, thousands of genes. Here we're looking at a few hundred where each row is a gene. Uh, each column is the average expression level within a treatment and the color indicates whether that gene is upregulated or downregulated relative to the average, which is you know, green, or, green or red. Right? So it's just a way of displaying transcriptional changes for lots of genes in, in one view. So here's the, the gill in fresh water, and here it is uh, one, after, one hour after a transition to seawater. So a lot of transcriptional changes going on just within an hour of, of dropping this fish at seawater. And, and we've known for a while that you can actually block this adjustment to seawater by whacking them with a little bit of arsenic. Not enough arsenic to like be really toxic, just like any other pharmacological thing. Like you can <coughs> dose your creature or your patient with enough of a pharmaceutical to uh, to to block some sort of physiology or to adjust some physiology, but obviously with enough, most pharmaceuticals you're gonna kill people. Same thing with arsenic, you don't want to take too much arsenic, but with a little bit. When you're not making the animal sick with arsenic, you can actually block 
this uh, physiologic response. So we whack them with a teeny bit of arsenic, uh, and they're still in seawater, but they're showing this very distinctly freshwater transcriptome. Uh, and so we were using this as, you know, perhaps, you know, these genes that are, are sort of flexibility enabling genes. These are the things that we block pharmacologically and that lead to uh, maladjustment uh, to the salinity environment. So we were focused on a number of these genes and trying to understand something about what they could tell us uh, about this, this kind of physiology. So it turns out if you look at these, we call these our plasticity genes or our osmoregulatory enabling genes. We'll, we'll call them plasticity genes um, and compared to other genes. So here we're looking at the amount of inter-individual variations. So there are a pile of individual fish that are making up these, these averages that we're showing here. And what we're looking at is how much variation there is among individuals and the expression level, the transcript abundance for these genes. And what we find is that our plasticity enabling genes have lower uh, levels of inter-individual variation than, um, than other genes that are expressed in the, in the transcriptome. Uh, so lower inter-individual variation expression. Um, and also when you look at different populations, our plasticity enabling genes, um, a population that's expanded its range into freshwater uh, recently has even more reduced inter-individual variation compared to populations that live in, in slightly less dynamic environments in terms of the, the salinity fluctuations that they're, they're experiencing. So plasticity genes have reduced inter-individual variation, especially in populations that have recently invaded a different osmotic environment. And it turns out that plasticity genes have fewer regulatory connections as well. So if you're to take these genes that, uh, that are plasticity genes and infer uh, the number of connections that they have upstream of them in regulatory networks, uh, we found that our plasticity genes, which are these red ones, have, I mean, it's hard to explain this diagram, but this is the distribution of regulatory connections. They've got fewer regulatory connections than other genes uh, in the genome. Um, and also, uh, these osmoregulatory abilities, you know, they vary a little bit among individuals, but they're not correlated with any other physiologies that you might predict. So here's um, a bunch of individuals from an admixed population, um, and we're looking at their ability to regulate plasma chloride. Uh, and we're asking whether your ability to regulate plasma chloride across whatever, 400 fish, is correlated with variation in metabolic rate or variation in hypoxia. And there's no correlation there. So it indicates that osmoregulatory abilities are not, not correlated with other physiological traits, that perhaps there's some, some modularity here. Um, so that indicates, you know, what we're sort of drawing from this is that our plasticity enabling genes, those transcriptional <laughs> programs, are under sort of uh, evolutionary constraint. There's lower inter-individual variation in the expression of those genes and other genes in the genome. They tend to have fewer regulatory connections, so perhaps they're more, uh, more modular uh, uh, and more perhaps evolvable uh, than other, uh, other genes in the genome. And, um, and that they're not correlated with other traits can perhaps mean that these, uh, there's, there's less uh, constraint on their evolvability than if there was a lot of correlations with other physiological abilities. So we're still sort of at the very sort of descriptive level of uh, sort of looking at patterns of inter individual variation. We're trying to reconstruct um, regulatory networks, uh, and that's some of the stuff I'm going to come back to at the end are some experiments that we started and we're trying to get funding for to do it uh, uh, to include more species. But what I want to talk a little bit about now is depart a little bit from talking about urihalinity and what seems to be features of urihalinity and talk about some of these marine to freshwater transitions that we're using killifish as a model for. So when you think of marine to freshwater transitions, there's uh, some examples of sort of morphological changes that go on there, uh, physiological changes, but perhaps some changes in the microbiome are also really important, which I'll, I'll get to in a, in a little bit. So, Probably what we've seen most of in the literature are the kinds of morphological changes that go on when you go from a marine type to a freshwater type, um, partly because of sort of the fame of, of Stickleback uh, as a model system, 
Um, so their invasion of fresh water is uh, repeated all the way along across the range. And these invasions of, of fresh water are associated with a loss of armor plating in the freshwater types compared to the marine types, and uh, changes in sort of pelvis structure as well. So, um, so stuglebacks have been an important model system for looking at morphological changes as you go from marine type to a freshwater type. Um, and we've been using, uh, but remarkably little has been done on the physiology of sticklebacks as they go from marine to freshwater, although there are a, a few studies. And that's what we've been using killifish as a model for, is to study some of the physiological changes that accompany or are required for these transitions from a marine type to a freshwater type. <coughs> and remember, you know, a key challenge here uh, is to be able to you know, move or retain water and ions in your body as you, as you make these, as you occupy these different environments. So uh, the genus Fundulus is, uh, uh, we've been trying to develop as a model, a comparative model system for studying these kinds of transitions. So remember what I told you before and that, that phylogeny of all the fishes, that most clades of fish were exclusively marine or exclusively freshwater. That means if you want to compare freshwater marine species, you're usually comparing pretty distantly related species, which isn't, which has its problems if you're trying to do comparative uh, physiology. But um, fundulus is one of those unusual clades where there's actually both types, uh, marine types, urihaline types, and, and freshwater stenohaline types. So that provides a nice comparative system of <clears throat> reasonably closely related species that have pretty different physiologies. So, um, so we can see here, this is the genus Fundulus. Um, uh, marine physiology is blue, the freshwater physiology is red. And you can see there's uh, one radiation under freshwater here, another at least second independent radiation of freshwater here, and another uh, freshwater radiation here in Lucania, which is actually within Fundulus. Uh, that's for Chris to sort out the naming of these, these species. Um, so there's both ancient radiations in freshwater and very recent radiations in freshwater that are at least three independent events. So we're trying to take advantage of these independent contrasts and stuff that we're just starting to do now. But the work that we've done um, earlier to stuff that we've got ongoing right now is focusing at the microevolutionary scale within fundulus heteroclitus. Okay? So there's Fundulus heteroclitus, cute little fish that are a couple inches long. Um, and they've got a really wide uh, distribution from Nova Scotia all the way down to Florida. Um, so a long latitudinal distribution, but also a pretty broad distribution when you go from the coast uh, in. So they occupy exclusively marine habitats, but also uh, into estuaries like Chesapeake Bay and Delaware Bay and, and so on. So here, uh, we're zooming in on Chesapeake Bay, and here we can see the salinity gradient in Chesapeake Bay as we go from, here's the mouth of Chesapeake Bay, you know, Norfolk, Virginia, and as we go up into the Potomac River, there's Washington, D.C., it gets more and more dilute to dilute fresh water. And here's like the tidal freshwater boundary right around here, and right around here, the same spot on, the, on uh, James River, Richmond is uh, up there. And so we've been studying populations collected from along this uh, gradient. So this species, their distribution goes all the way into dilute fresh water. If you go to like really far inland, they start to be replaced by other, other species. But you can find <coughs> sizable populations all the way along these, these salinity gradients. Um, so we started doing some experiments with populations from these sort of uh, saltier habitats and these freshwater habitats to see if there's any sort of physiological divergence between these populations in relation to their possible regulatory physiology. Mm -hmm. So we bring them in the lab. Um, so we've got our, our salty native population collected from around here, right? And then our freshwater native population collected from like right downstream of, of DC. Our field site's literally right across the river from, uh, what's that, what's George Washington's house called? Yeah, yeah, um, right there. So, uh, so yeah, that's our freshwater native population, okay? And then we did experiments where we had them, we had them acclimated to either freshwater and did a, a, a saltwater challenge, 
um, in which case our saltwater native is like that's kind of the environment they'd be used to, and these guys are the oddballs. And then we also did the reverse experiment where they acclimate to the seawater and do a freshwater challenge, in which case these guys would be presumably more happy. So we're interested in what are these different populations doing differently, if anything, when challenged with the salty end of things or the freshwater end of things. Right? And we looked at their ability to regulate sodium and chloride. And here, uh, so here is kind of like what sodium and chloride levels are doing through time during an acclimation period to this, to this transfer, right? Okay, so what I want to highlight here are where there are really obvious differences between populations. So here, sodium, when you give them a freshwater challenge, they both kind of lose it, but then they recover it pretty quickly, both populations. There's no difference between populations there. <clears throat> and then when you look at the saltwater challenge, neither population really blinks. They're able to regulate chloride all the way, all the way through. When you look at sodium for the uh, freshwater population, they lose it, whereas the seawater native one doesn't. But the opposite is true for the seawater guys when they find themselves in freshwater. Again, the sodium story is not different between populations, but here the chloride story is different between populations, where these guys, the non-native ones compared to the challenge, really lose it. And they don't even recover it after a couple weeks, whereas these guys hardly blink at all. Right? So what I've highlighted here are the differences between populations. And those differences are really informative if you know a little bit about the this, this sort of cellular physiology of what's going on here. So um, in fresh water, you're uptaking sodium from the environment across an ionocyte, you know. Uh, and you're not uptaking chloride, but you're limiting chloride loss. Uh, so killifish actually don't have active chloride uptake. Well, what they do in a dilute environment is they really restrict your loss of chloride, which happens between adjacent cells across what are called paracellular type junctions. Right? So the business of uh, losing chloride regulation has to do with type junctions. You find yourself in fresh water. Okay. In seawater, you're getting rid of chloride across the cell. Um, but you're getting rid of sodium across the tight junction, right? So again, this uh, dysregulation of sodium is also pointing us toward the tight junction. So it seems like the population divergence here at either end of the continuum of whether you're saltwater native and freshwater or freshwater native and saltwater has to do with what's going on at the tight junctions. So that was some physiological evidence. Remember tight junction, I'm gonna say it again. <laughs> Uh, it was some quite satisfying where other data types were pointing us towards the importance of tight junctions for these freshwater adapted versus seawater adapted kind of creatures. Okay? So we started doing some, um, some genetics, some quantitative genetics, and some population genetics. So here we took advantage of a pop. So here's our, what we're calling our salty population, and here's our freshwater native population. <clears throat> and between them is a population that's really nicely admixed. A genetically admixed between the seawater genotypes and the freshwater genotypes. And with an admixed population, you can kind of do genotype, phenotype association studies. Right? So when you look at their physiology, their ability to regulate plasma chloride when they're challenged with seawater, we see um, uh, quite a bit of variation among individuals within this admixed population. So a lot of inter-individual variation there that we could uh, that we could try to make genotype associations with, right? So again, here we've, uh, these are just sort of genome-wide genotypes, RADSeq for those of you that know. Um, and what we find is that the freshwater native population is really distinct from the brackish water native population, and that this population in between is nicely admixed between the two populations when you look at the genotypic proportions uh, in these, these individuals, right? So we took, uh, we did GWAS, where we were trying to associate genotype with uh, your physiological type. There's about 400 fish that we, uh, that we genotyped and phenotyped in this admixed population. So testing for what are genotypes that are perhaps predictive of your ability to, to regulate chloride, given a, a seawater challenge. And also, 
uh, doing selection scans comparing the freshwater native and brackish water native populations. Comparing those, contrasting those two populations, are there loci that appear to be evolving under, uh, under selection in those populations? And are the GWAS, the same loci, the ones that are evolving under selection, are genes that are predictive of your ability to regulate chloride also under selection uh, as you make this transition from a rain environment to a freshwater environment? Andrew, the, yeah. um, admixed proportions look remarkably constant across remarkably, the yeah. in individuals. Well, yeah. Why is that? There's actually, there is quite a bit of variation if you blow it up here, but we don't have any like first generation or second generation hybrids here. Um, that it sort of spans sort of mostly like 50 to 62 uh, percent freshwater proportion seems to be the case. But yeah, it's uh, there is some diversity, but we're we're not getting a lot of uh, very recent migrants. So we did the GWAS. We find uh, a few dozen loci that account for quite a bit of the variation. For those of you that do GWAS, you know, 54% is a pretty decent amount of the physiological variation. Uh, that's accounted for by by 20, 26 loci. So that tells us that it's not just one or two genes that are important here, that your ability to regulate chloride homeostasis is polygenic. Lots of genes and genetic variants are, are probably important for that. So lots of dials to pull. It's not just one big pull of a lever on a few genes that transition you from your ability to regulate chloride really well versus losing it quite badly. Right? And a number of the, the genes that were associated here uh, made, made sense in terms of what we know about the physiology. A uh, number of proteins that are important for those cell-cell junctions, and a number of proteins that are involved uh, in ion transport. Okay, so when we look uh, genome-wide, we also did that selection scan, right, where we contrasted these two populations looking for genotypes that are under selection. And then we overlaid the loci that were our GWAS hits, the ones that are, were associated with physiology. And a number of our GWAS, a number of our loci that are associated with physiology are also these outliers, these sign showing these signatures of selection in the, in the genome scans. And more than you'd expect by chance. So that was, <clears throat> that was satisfying. That the genes that are, are associated, uh, the genetic variation that's associated with the trait that we think is evolving, um, those genetic variants appear to be under, under selection along this gradient. Um, there were also a number of other outliers, you know, selection scan outliers that weren't GWAS outliers. Most of them were not GWAS associated. But remarkably, a lot of these were associated with genes that we know are really important in, um, in ionocyte function and be able to regulate um, the movement of ions. Uh, sodium potassium ATPase, uh, sodium bicarbonate transporter, sodium hydrogen exchanger, and carbonic anhydrase and rhesus glycoprotein. I mean, when you put all of these proteins together in a cell and you show it to physiologists, they're like, that is, uh, you need all of those proteins uh, to uptake sodium so, uh, from a dilute environment. So we're perhaps looking at a sodium uptake metabolic unit that's a bit evolving by selection here. And perhaps the reason they didn't show up in our GWAS is because our GWAS <coughs> was for your ability to regulate chloride with a seawater challenge. Um, maybe if we did a freshwater challenge and measured your ability to regulate sodium, uh, these other variants would have shown up not only as uh, under selection, but also associated with the other aspect of physiology that's important, sodium instead of just chloride. Uh, Marvel D2, which is a tight junction protein, a tricellular tight junction protein, was both a GWAS hit um, and um, a selection scan outlier. So these are proteins that regulate the permeability of tight junctions where three cells uh, come together um, in, the, in the surface of the gill. You're not really able to see this very well, but here are your gill cells, and here are the tricellular tight junctions, and that's where tri you find tricellulin, um, which, which is important for permeability of the gill to sodium and chloride. So this is quite satisfying that to us, that stuff seemed to make sense physiologically and genetically and associated with phenotypes. Um, we're, we don't do microbiome stuff. Well, we haven't before. Um, but we started thinking uh, about perhaps, you know, as the importance of the microbiome has become 
uh, more and more apparent uh, from a variety of studies, we started thinking about that for this work, mainly because there's a paper published by Rob Knight, who's like Mr. Global Microbiome Stuff, that um, when you look at microbial communities worldwide in different habitats, what are the environmental features that explain the most diversity? And what their, one of their early studies showed was that salinity was the most important factor, more so than altitude or temperature or moist, you know, moisture or any of this kind of stuff in, in defining and in, in explaining the diversity of microbes that we see across different habitats on planet Earth. So if the microbial communities are radically different between salty and fresh environments, and microbiomes are really important for many aspects of physiology, maybe a part of the adaptive leap from a marine to freshwater environment is perhaps some sort of co-adaptation with uh, the new microbiomes that you found find there. Go figure that it's probably more complex than just being able to regulate ions. Um, that might be uh, your, your symbionts and how you interact with them might also be important. So this is their data showing that salinity really just, uh, defines a lot of the variation that we see in microbial communities. So uh, as a first pass at this, we thought, well, let's just go out there and describe the kind of variation that we see in microbiomes as we go along these salinity gradients. So we went back to the Chesapeake Bay, and uh, we collect uh, poop and gut lining and gill and sediment and water from uh, from fish and from sediment water from along these gradients. So gut and gill microbiomes from 10 fish per site. Um, and then they, uh, that's for these guys, heteroclitus, that span the whole range. And then also for congener magellus, which they overlap with here, and congener diaphanous that they overlap with at this site. Um, and here is just, you know, genetic variation uh, of these fish along this climb as we go from marine to into fresh water. And we see their genotype really start to transition from a freshwater type, or seawater type to a freshwater type right around here, this tidal freshwater boundary. So this is just the first pass, brand new data of very early stages. We did the PCA plot, what everyone does when they first get their data back. And what popped out of this, I'll walk you through it, this is the James River where we're looking at the gill microbiome. We see that our, fresh, our samples from freshwater populations really cluster quite distinctly, the red, blue, and orange, uh, green ones, and quite distinctly from, um, from the downstream saltier populations. Okay? Um, and same thing for the intestine, that our freshwater populations here seem to be quite distinct from, from the saltier populations there. So, we see along this very sort of short geographic gradient a big transition going when you go from marina to fresh water. And what we want to do next is, again, go back to some of these admix populations and say, are there any genotype microbiome associations here that might indicate that there's some, there's some host genotype microbiome association which tells you that perhaps there's some co-adaptation going on here. Um, for those of you that are microbiome folks, I'd love to hear your ideas, maybe how to do that more sophisticated way. But at least as a first pass, there seems to be some interesting variation that's partitioned along the gradient here. Um, another brand new stuff that we're doing is we're starting to blow back out to the macroevolutionary perspective. Again, remember there we've got, so here's heteroclitus, those, that one species that occupies that whole gradient along Chesapeake Bay, uh, Uri Haley. Um, that's the work that I've shown you so far. We're now blowing out to include many more species that include both uh, these guys here that retain the ancestral sort of salt taller type, as well as uh, derived freshwater stenohaline types in that clay, and some of these guys here that, that represent the radiation of freshwater here, as well as these two species. And we brought these into the lab um, just because we wanted to do a better phylogeny. Um, with more genes, we're like, let's get RNA from all these species, get many more loci. But we thought, at the same time, uh, why don't we bring a few more fish of each of those species so we could do at least a little experiment, where we take fish from each of these species and put them in fresh water and put them in seawater and look at transcriptional changes in those two different environments. So again, this is the PCA from that. Um, and what we see here is, here's uh, transcriptomes from fish from clade 1, fish from clade 2, and fish from clade 3. So there's a strong phylogenetic signal here. Uh, but in red are the, the transcriptomes from the freshwater fish within that clade. 
and blue is from the marine fish from that clade. And we can see fairly parallel shifts in the, tra the gill transcriptome as you go from a, a marine physiological type to a freshwater physiological type each time you do that, uh, evolutionarily speaking. So quite a bit of parallelism here, and uh, I generated this on the train yesterday. I don't know what it means <laughs> yet, but we first started looking for genes that are showing a highly conserved transcriptional response to a uh, saltwater challenge across all of these species. So we got about 15 species here. We split them out by clay that you saw before, are these three colors at the top. And then I've coded them by their physiological type, whether you're from a marine environment or a freshwater environment. And then what your condition is in the lab, whether you're in freshwater or salty water, right? Um, so for each species here, here's Fundulus grandis in freshwater and seawater. Here's Fundulus heteroclitus in freshwater and seawater. Okay, so you can see that's how we sort of organized it. And so we pulled out, I asked, are there many genes that show a really common transcriptional response no matter what physiological type you are. And sure enough, there's a pile of genes in there that show a really common transcriptional response. And a lot of the key players that you think about as key players in ionocyte, like sodium potassium ETPase and the chloride transporter and the bicarbonate exchanger, a lot of those things that are part of that, that cell type that are considered the key players of autoregulation are all showing a really conserved response. So even if you're a stenohaline freshwater species, you still retain that machinery and that response to this, uh, to this, ch this kind of challenge. And then we also asked, uh, are there genes that show a really different response between a freshwater physiological type and a marine physiological type given this challenge that are uh, conserved? Right? So each time you uh, evolve a freshwater type, does it show the same different response compared to its marine ancestor? And there are a pile of those genes too. You can see here the marine types responded by downregulation and the freshwater types responded by upregulation upreg in both clade 1, clade 2, and clade 3. And what kind of surprised me is within here we find a whole pile of circadian rhythm genes like clock and period and cryptochrome which uh, I've been thinking a while about what, what's the difference between going from a marine to a freshwater environment is also a loss of tidal cues. So there's actually tidal clocks in estuarine species, just like circadian clocks in everything else. Um, and perhaps part of this transition from marine type to a freshwater type is your loss of the ability to, to cue into uh, tidal cues, which can be changes in salinity. That's just a thing off the top of my head. But what really slapped me in the face was all of the the circadian rhythm genes that were popping out in this, this set of transcripts. And we're also generating reference genomes from a pile of these freshwater marine types from each clade. So I know some of you have to go, many of you have to go, so I'm going to skip through the conclusions now. So adaptation from marine to freshwater environments is important for phyletic diversity within fishes. Uh, much of the molecular machinery that underlies osmoregulation is ancient. You find them in sharks and you find them in lampreys and all these other things. These transitions Marine to fresh are really asymmetric. Urihaline species might be important for seeding diversification uh, uh, between marine and freshwater environments. The urihalinity enabling gene expression modules seem to be under evolutionary constraint in, evolution in estuarine fish. We show that reduced inter individual variation. Um, and osmoregulation is a trait that's underlain by many genes. It's not just a couple of genes that explain the variation in physiological. <coughs> abilities for osmoregulation. Genetic variation that's associated with osmoregulatory abilities is evolving along solidity gradients. Um, but other traits might be important too, not just your ability to regulate ions, but perhaps also microbiome associations. Um, and much of the transcriptional response to salinity we see is evolutionary conserved, even in types that are find themselves exclusively in fresh water. So that these are the people that actually do the work. Uh, like many of us, we have the, the this, you know, the real pleasure of interacting with, with lots of other research labs, including physiologists and geneticists and microbiome folks. A lot of the recent transcriptome and whole genome work is by a very talented PhD student who's graduating this year, Lisa, Lisa Johnson. And there are some of the papers as supported by the NSF. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Somebody could get the light.
lights 